Missions is the task that the Lord Jesus Christ has given His church. As He was about to uh, ascend up unto heaven, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ gave this great commission, a mandate which He expected the church to accomplish. He says, proclaim the gospel to the whole world. To the entire world make disciples of all the nations this mandate is what we would call as the great commission of our lord jesus christ now this is not an option for the church uh, the uh, highly acclaimed pastor teacher by the name of john piper has this to say about what ought to be our position in missions. We are either goers or givers, he says. We are either in one of two positions. Uh, either we are going personally to uh, various places in order to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, or we are in the position of enabling missionaries, enabling people to go into other nations and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Outside of this, well, we are simply called as disobedient. Today, we will be looking at a letter of a missionary to his supporting church. Uh, this letter was written by the Apostle Paul. And the recipients of the letter is that of the Philippian church. In this uh, letter, the Apostle Paul thanks the Philippian church for their active participation in his missionary work. And further, he also writes to keep their passion for missions alive. We've uh, titled the message as Partnership in the Gospel. Now, we will be surveying uh, the entire letter, uh, but for, for our main text, I would want us to read Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And this is what that passage says. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Notice that uh, the Apostle Paul had this sweet and intimate relationship with the Philippian church. Uh, the church was a product of the missionary work of the Apostle Paul while in Europe. And from that day, the very first day, that day when they uh, accepted the gospel message, they became committed supporters of the Apostle Paul. They joined with the Apostle Paul in his mission work in various ways. And we see in the letter how they participated in the mission work of the Apostle Paul, which gives us an idea of how our church can participate in mission work. For one, uh, they were financial supporters of the Apostle Paul. They were faithful supporters of his ministry. Now, Money talks, doesn't it? It speaks a lot about what is in our hearts. It speaks a lot about our passion in life. The Lord Jesus Christ says, Where you put your money, where you put your treasure, there your heart will be also. Ah, it is so telling about uh, 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 the contents of our hearts. It is so telling about our passion in life. And the Philippian church put their money where their mouth was. In other words, they said that they were disciples of Christ. Uh, they accepted 
the gospel message with all of their hearts and they showed, they manifested their commitment to Jesus Christ by being committed to His cause. And they did so through their giving, their financial giving. Uh, the Apostle Paul has this to say about uh, uh, the quality of their giving. And mind you, this church wasn't a rich church. In fact, it was going through a lot of problems. It was going through various types of opposition and persecution. And yet there was no excuse for them not to participate in missions. In chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, the Apostle Paul says this, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Ah, don't you love the commitment of these, uh, of these people, of these believers? They were faithful in their support of their missionary, the Apostle Paul. They considered the Apostle Paul as a partner, an extension of their church. He wasn't a charity case, but rather the Apostle Paul did for them what they personally could not do. And so they considered him as an extension of his church, of their church. Furthermore, uh, the Philippian church supported the ministry, the mission work of the Apostle Paul through their fervent prayers. In that letter, the Apostle Paul thanks them for their prayers for him. Uh, you see, the Apostle Paul was on trial for his faith. He was in Rome as a prisoner and uh, he was going through a trial upon the will of God because what God wanted him to do was to uh, testify about Jesus Christ. And uh, he could only do that by way of being a prisoner. And yet, he was quite positive that he would be freed, he would be acquitted. And he was. All all thanks to the prayers of these Philippian believers. And not content with financial support and prayer support, uh, but uh, the Philippian church also supported the ministry of the Apostle Paul by attending to his physical needs. Uh, notice this passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. The Apostle Paul writes, But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. I want you to underscore the last, uh, the last clause, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Uh, not content with just sending their financial support, but they even personally sent uh, one of their leaders, Epaphroditus, in order to attend to the physical needs of their missionary, the Apostle Paul. Now, we could only speculate as to what Epaphroditus did in order to meet the needs, the physical needs of, uh, of the Apostle Paul. But nonetheless, we see there uh, that the church went the extra mile. They sent one of their faithful people in order to serve their missionary. 
uh, making us realize that they considered the Apostle Paul, their missionary, as an extension of their church. He wasn't, uh, he, he wasn't outside the fellowship of the church. He was very much part of the church because he was doing what the church could not do. And so we, we love that spirit, don't we? Uh, we love the, uh, the passion of this church for missions. And certainly the Apostle Paul want to keep that, wanted to keep that passion for missions alive. That passion for missions burning in their hearts. And so in this letter, he addresses certain items, certain areas, which if addressed, if attended to, this would sustain their passion for missions. The first concern we read in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And this is a prayer of the Apostle Paul. He tells them, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Uh, what was the first concern of the Apostle Paul? Uh, what area of life did the Apostle Paul wanted the church to address? It is their pursuit of spiritual maturity. Their pursuit of spiritual maturity. He wanted them to keep on pursuing spiritual growth in their lives. What does this have to do with missions? Huh? A lot. Well, our passion for missions cannot be, cannot exist outside the framework of our own passion for God. That's where it springs from. Our passion for missions springs from our pursuit of spiritual maturity. We cannot expect church people to burn with passion for the kingdom work if they are not being developed towards spiritual maturity. And that's something that the church ought to prioritize. Many things spring from, uh, from this, uh, this uh, 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 foundation of spiritual maturity. If people are pursuing growth, pursuing their own spiritual development, then it follows that they would be passionate about evangelism. They would be passionate about mission work. For this is at the very heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we are growing in the Word, when we are growing in our personal communion with God, we sense the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? We, we sense His concern. What, uh, what makes Jesus Christ really excited and really joyful. We read in the Gospels that heaven rejoices upon the salvation of people. And so that ought to be a source of our joy as well. That ought to be our passion as well. And our passion for missions spring from our own passion for God. Let's pause here and reflect on this question. What are we doing? Uh, to keep, uh, to keep our, uh, our passion for God aflame. 
uh, are we are we pursuing our own spiritual development the two go hand in hand uh, our passion for missions cannot exist outside our own passion for spiritual maturity uh, another concern of the apostle paul and an urge that he makes you know is that of preaching the gospel wherever god has put them again we wonder what the connection is now understand this we cannot be passionate about missions abroad uh, going to other places outside our familiar surroundings, you know, if we are not passionate in reaching out to those people within our own sphere. Wherever God puts us, you know, we ought to be faithful in personally bringing the gospel to them, our homes, our families, right? Our, uh, our own uh, uh, places of work or study if we are students. Whatever the situation may be, we ought to be faithful in sharing Jesus Christ with others. In Philippians chapter 1, 27 and 28, he urges, the Apostle Paul urges the Philippian believers, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you what is missions all about missions is not simply going to other places per se but it is actually advancing the gospel message there is no missions apart from the proclamation of the gospel and so we Christians ought to burn with passion for evangelism, for sharing the gospel message personally where God has put us. Wherever God has put us, that is our mission field, isn't it? And you know what? Uh, when we are personally passionate about sharing the gospel, uh, uh, advancing, advancing the message of salvation with those within our sphere of influence, this would also keep us passionate about spreading the gospel to other lands, to other places, right? Somehow, somehow, people, Christians, lack passion for missions because they do not have any, any passion to reach out to their loved ones, their friends, the people within their immediate sphere of influence. And that ought to be a concern of the local church. I, I do believe, first and foremost, uh, the church ought to train their people to articulate the gospel message. They ought to know the gospel, first and foremost, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's quite sad uh, that in many churches, there are people, there are even members, sometimes even leaders, you know, when they are given the opportunity to share the gospel, somehow they're at a loss. They don't know what the gospel is. Don't you find that? not only sad but quite interesting how did they get saved in the first place if they don't know the gospel so uh, uh, that ought to be an objective of the church 
The objective, the primary objective of the church is to teach, to train their people to articulate the gospel message so that wherever they are, wherever God puts them, they, they share, they effectively share the gospel message with others. Uh, such was the, uh, the condition of the Apostle Paul. As uh, I have mentioned, uh, the Apostle Paul was in Rome as a prisoner. And while in prison, he was in house arrest, uh, yet he did not use his predicament as an excuse not to share the gospel. Notice what he says in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. He says there, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, that is his imprisonment, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Wow! His incarceration was no excuse for him not to share the gospel. And so we read in verse 13, as a result, it has been clear throughout the palace, the whole palace guard, and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. <laughs> you see, the very guards uh, that were assigned to, well, guard him, became captive audience for the Apostle Paul. Uh, he wasn't chained to them. <laughs> As far as the Apostle Paul was concerned, they were chained to him. They were captive audience. And uh, he, had, he had various opportunities to share the gospel with them. That's what I'm saying. The church, wherever God puts them, wherever God puts us believers, we ought to be sharing the gospel. And our passion for personal evangelism also helps us keep our passion for missions alive. The Apostle Paul did not allow difficult situations, you know, to prevent him from preaching the gospel, not even incarceration. A third concern of the Apostle Paul, one that if addressed would lead us, would help us keep our passion for missions alive. And this is the unity of the church. We ought to, we ought to pursue unity in our local churches. And sometimes that is tough work, isn't it? Uh, we work with various uh, people, with all kinds of personalities and agendas, priorities. So it's difficult to uh, unite our people and to keep them on the same page. But let, let me read to you Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Paul addresses this. He tells them, you know, pursue the unity of the church. Make my joy complete, he says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Who we ask ourselves again, what does this have to do with keeping our passion for missions alive? Well, the mission thrust of the church cannot succeed if the church is not on the same page. It's, this is a no-brainer, isn't it? Uh, the church in Philippi, you see, was threatened with division. 
We had uh, we we see all kinds of personalities, you know, uh, uh, strong personalities pulling the church to one side and another per party to the other side. Uh, this th this church was threatened with division, not because of theology, but mainly because of personality and philosophy. Some wanted to go this way, and there are others wanting to, wanting to go the other way. That would certainly divide the church. And that's what the enemy wants, right? That's what the enemy uh, intends the church uh, to, to be, to be divided, to be, to be severed. And when the church is divided, then they become ineffective in, uh, in advancing the kingdom work. Ah, we must keep the church on the same page. And with regard to missions, all of us must be on the same page as to what the mission of the church is. Uh, if we are not heading towards the same direction and we are not passionate about the same cause, then certainly this would impede uh, the advancement of the cause of Jesus Christ in our church. Uh, our church will not be able to pursue to fulfill the Great Commission mandate when people are divided with regard to its purpose, to its mission in life, or mission for its existence. Pursue spiritual maturity. Proclaim the gospel faithfully wherever God puts you. Foster unity in the local church. Make sure that everyone is on the same page as far as the church's mission and purpose is concerned. And lastly, certainly not the least, the Apostle Paul addresses another concern, the concern of drawing our sense of satisfaction from our own relationship with Jesus Christ. He uh, mentions uh, several, uh, a number of uh, similar commands. Uh, for instance, he mentions, Rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, that is, regardless of the circumstances, rejoice in the Lord. He also says afterwards, Be content. Whatever the situation may be. He also adds, uh, pray always. Again, regardless of the situation, we ought not to be caught up in anxiety. We should not be worried about our circumstances, circumstances but to be always praying to God. What does this tell us? It the Apostle Paul is urging the Christians to draw their sense of satisfaction uh, from Christ and Christ alone. Uh, the Apostle Paul is urging believers not to be dictated by external circumstances, but to allow internal principles to dictate one's disposition in life. We should be satisfied, content with our relationship with Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I, you, perhaps you are familiar with the bumper sticker that says, Christ is enough. Christ is is enough. What a beautiful statement, isn't it? Are we content with Christ and Christ alone? Is Christ enough for us? We ought to ask ourselves that question 
You know? Uh, if we have Jesus Christ, then we have everything in life, don't we? And that ought to keep us satisfied. In fact, we can lose everything. But we, if we have Jesus Christ, then we have everything to gain, don't we? That's our satisfaction in Christ and Christ alone. And beloved, isn't it that when we are satisfied with Christ, we open our hands, you know, to the advancement of the gospel message. Uh, we don't consider giving. We don't consider our help, the help that we extend to people as a burden. Because we're content in life. We're satisfied with Jesus Christ. And again, this is where mission springs from. The participation of the church. Its passion for mission is kept alive when the people are satisfied with Christ and Christ alone. Are we? Are, can we say in our heart of hearts that we are satisfied with Jesus Christ? This ought to reflect in, uh, in our own participation in missions. Are we generous when it comes to sharing with, uh, uh, with others in mission work? Are we, are we finding ourselves uh, tightening our grip because we are so fearful about what may happen in the future? Understand this, you know, that Christ's desire and Christ's mandate is for us to Go and make disciples of all the nations. That's our scope. We should do it where we are. Yes, we should do it in our locale, in our immediate sphere. But the scope also is the globe, is all nations. That's the scope of the Great Commission mandate. And we ought to be passionate about bringing the gospel to various places because such is the heartbeat of our Lord Jesus Christ. Four concerns, four major concerns that if we are to attend to these, these would keep our passion for missions alive. May the Lord continue to use us mightily as we burn with passion for the cause of Jesus Christ.